Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about matrices, but before we dive into that, let's first discuss linear transformations. A linear transformation changes our 3D or 2D space in such a way that parallel lines remain parallel and evenly spaced, and such that the origin doesn't move. Let's take this vector V, with components 2 and 3 for example, and perform a linear transformation. The questions that I want to answer in this video are where does this vector end up and how do we describe this linear transformation? Let's go back to the untransformed version. It turns out all we need to describe a linear transformation is to keep track of where e hat x and e hat y end up after the transformation. I'm also gonna rewrite our vector using unit vector notation, which you should be familiar with if you've watched my video on vectors. If we now perform the same transformation we had before, we can see that our vector is equal to two steps in the direction of the transformed e hat x and three steps in the direction of the transformed e hat y. The only question that remains now is how we assign the values of our transformed e hat x and the transformed e hat y. It turns out we can just read those values on the untransformed coordinate system, and notice that I left a copy of the transformed version in the background. According to this, e hat x ended up at 1, 0 0.5, and e hat y ended up at negative 2, 1. And now we can just fill in these values in the formula of our vector. The first part describes this red vector, and the second part describes this green vector. And if we take their sum, we of course get the blue vector. And if we calculate that result, we get a vector that is equal to negative 4, 4, which you can also just read on the untransformed coordinate system. It's now time to introduce the concept of a matrix. As we just saw, all we need to describe a linear transformation is to keep track of where e hat x and e hat y go. We can then assign coordinates to them based on the untransformed coordinate system. And now a matrix is nothing more than a way to package these two vectors into one single grid. This grid of numbers, which we call a 2x2 two two matrix, describes a two-dimensional linear transformation. The first column of this matrix describes where e hat x goes, and the second column of this matrix describes where e hat y goes. If we now take a vector, for example 2, 3, the one we had earlier, and we want to know where it ends up after we transform it by our matrix, all we have to do is multiply our vector by that matrix. And this is rather easy. We just take the product of the first column of our matrix with the first element of our vector. And then we add the product of the second column of our matrix with the second element of our vector. This is of course equal to negative 4, 4, which is a result we already calculated earlier. We now just did it without looking at the coordinate system. We'll now go over a bunch of specific matrices and transformations, starting with the identity matrix, which I like to think of as just no transformation at all. If we don't perform any transformation, then e hat x ends up at 1, 0, and e hat y ends up at 0, 1. If we package all of this in a single matrix, we get the identity matrix, which we write as i subscript 2, where the 2 indicates that this is a 2 by 2 matrix. An identity matrix is always filled with zeros, except for the diagonal from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, which is filled with 1s. Our next transformation is scaling. Let's say we have this blue vector and we scale it by a specific factor. Then all we have to do to describe this transformation is take our original coordinate system and see where e hat x and e hat y end up. e hat x would end up at sx0, where sx would be the scaling factor along the x-axis. We can do the same thing for e hat y, which would end up at 0 sy, where sy is the scaling factor along the y-axis. We can package all of this into a single matrix, which we would call a scaling matrix. This matrix scales our coordinate system by a factor that is defined 
by the factor s. Our next transformation is the rotation, for example a rotation of 20 degrees. Let's take back our original coordinate system to see where e hat x and e hat y end up. To make this a bit more clear, let me zoom in on the image. As you might notice, reading the value for e hat x and e hat y isn't as easy as with our scaling matrix. To describe how we can solve this problem, let me draw a circle which immediately shows that e hat x and e hat y describe a circle during their rotation. We can also draw two triangles beneath e hat x and e hat y. These two triangles have an equal angle which we'll call theta. You now see a circle and two triangles which means you should immediately think of trigonometry because that is exactly what we'll be using to solve this problem. After a rotation e hat x has a new x component which is equal to the cosine of theta and a new y component which is equal to the sine of theta. We can write all of that as a single vector. e hat y on the other hand will have a new y component of cosine theta and a new x component of negative sine theta which we can also write as a single vector. We can now package all of this in a single matrix which we call the rotation matrix. This matrix describes a rotation with an angle of theta. The final transformation I wanted to discuss is a translation, where we take our coordinate system and move it somewhere else. But wait a second, this moves the origin, which means this is no longer a linear transformation. This begs the question though, how do we describe this transformation? Well, it's actually not that difficult. We just take back our original coordinate system and all we need is a vector that points from our original origin to where we want the new origin to end up. Let's call that vector t with an x and a y component. e hat x and e hat y haven't moved, which means they end up at 1, 0 and 0, 1. If this confuses you because I said you should read the values for e hat x and e hat y on the untransformed coordinate system, then you should remind yourself of the fact that vectors do not have a position, so this is in fact correct. Anyways, we end up with a 2x2 two two matrix which describes a linear transformation and a two-dimensional vector which defines a translation. And now we can combine all of this into a single matrix, which we call the translation matrix, which translates by a vector t. You might notice that this is not our average matrix. It contains quite a lot of things. First of all, our 2x2 two two matrix, which describes the linear transformation. Second of all, a two-dimensional vector, which describes the translation. And then this strange thing at the bottom, an entire row of zeros that ends with a 1. What we have here is an augmented matrix whereby you take a matrix and add a new column to it. In this case, that column describes the translation. Unfortunately, the only way in which we can do this is by adding that row of zeros which ends in a 1 at the bottom. More specifically, this is an affine transformation matrix and it uses homogeneous coordinates to describe the translation. Explaining what that means is unfortunately beyond the scope of this video. If we now take a vector, we also have to augment that vector by adding a 1 at the bottom. And if we now want to know where our vector v ends up after a translation, we just multiply our translation matrix with our vector, which is equal to the first column of our matrix multiplied with the first element of our vector, to which we add the second column of our matrix multiplied by the second element of our vector, to which we add the last column of our matrix multiplied with the last element of our vector, which is equal to this new vector. And you might notice that a translation is actually just equal to taking our vector and adding the translation vector to it. With all of this knowledge, we're ready to move on to matrix multiplication. Let's first take a vector and apply some transformations to it. For example, this one, which is called a shear and is described by this matrix. Now let's also apply a 90 degree rotation, described by this matrix. 
The result of first applying a shear and then a rotation can also be written as a single matrix. We can of course find that out by taking our original coordinate system and reading that e hat x ends up at 0, negative 1 and e hat y ends up at 1, negative 0, 0.5, which gives us a new matrix. So first applying a shear and then applying a rotation is equal to just applying that one matrix as well. In other words, if we want to translate a vector, we could either first multiply it with the shear matrix, then with rotation matrix, or we could also just multiply our vector with the combined matrix. Notice here that we first applied the shear and then the rotation, which means we write matrices from right to left. The question now becomes, how do we calculate that combined matrix? And it turns out all we need to do is just multiply our two matrices together. Doing that is actually not that difficult. We already know how to multiply matrices and vectors. And as you know, a matrix just contains a bunch of vectors. For example, this one, which tells us where e hat x ends up after the shear. What we can do now is we could take that vector and multiply it with our left matrix. The result of this will tell us where the sheared e hat x will end up after applying the rotation. This is just a normal matrix vector multiplication, which we've done already a ton of times. It's equal to this and equal to 0, negative 1, which gives us the first column of our combined matrix. Now all we have to do is do this a second time, this time with vector e hat y of our shear matrix. We'll take that vector and multiply it with our rotation matrix. This tells us where the sheared e hat y ends up after applying the rotation. Once again, this is just a normal matrix vector multiplication, which is equal to this and equal to 1, negative 0 0.5, which gives us the second column of our combined matrix. You can use this method to multiply any matrix. In fact, multiplying a matrix and a vector is also just a matrix multiplication because you could think of the vector as a 1 by 2 matrix. There are some important things to keep in mind when multiplying matrices. The first one is that the amount of columns in the left matrix should be equal to the amount of rows in the right matrix. If this is not the case, matrices cannot be multiplied. Second of all, the amount of rows in the left matrix will be equal to the amount of rows in the resulting matrix. Similarly, the amount of columns in the right matrix will be equal to the amount of columns in the final matrix. Last but not least, it's also important that we multiply matrices in the correct order. For example, if we first apply a shear, described by this matrix, then a rotation, described by this matrix, then the result will be equal to this matrix. However, let's undo that, and instead of first applying the shear, we'll first apply the rotation, which was described by this matrix. We'll then apply the shear, described by this matrix, which gives us a new matrix. This is different from the result we had earlier. That is, the order in which we applied our transformations and the order in which we multiplied our matrices is opposite. This results in two different matrices and two different transformations. If you don't believe me, then just rewind the video to the point where I showed that previous one. Finally, I wanted to talk about how all of this can be applied in three dimensions. First of all, linear transformations can be described using this 3x3 three three matrix where the first column describes where e hat x lands after the transformation, the second column describes where e hat y ends after the transformation, and the third column describes where e hat z lands after the transformation. If you also want to describe a translation, then you can augment this matrix by adding a new column, which describes the translation, and by adding a row of zeros that ends in a 1 at the bottom. You should also augment your three-dimensional vector with a 1 at the bottom. Our identity matrix would look like this, which now makes it obvious that it is entirely filled with zeros, except for the diagonal that runs from the top left to the bottom right corner, which is filled with 1s. 
our scaling matrix would look like this, and our translation matrix would look like this. And finally, we have our rotation matrices. That's correct, we need three distinct matrices, one to rotate around the x-axis, one for the y-axis, and one for the z-axis. Notice that in two dimensions, we've been rotating around the z-axis, which is why that bottom matrix should look familiar. And that was it for this video. If you enjoyed the series, then consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash floatymonkey. And with that being said, I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.